Hey everybody, welcome back to Optimal Health Redefined. We are in part three of our video about how to get and achieve optimal health. I'm Sheila. And I'm Dr. Diane Ginsberg. Welcome back. Welcome back. So this last topic is going to be kind of a standalone because it's about sleep and sleep is really, really important. And it could be a whole long lecture, which we've talked about before on its own. Yes. Um, and so I'm going to go into a lot of the things that probably people have heard before with Matthew Walker, because I know you've mentioned him a lot in the podcast that he did with Chris Kresser a while back. I think it was like 2019. He's actually, he's actually got his own podcast now. If you go, if you Google Matt Walker podcast, he did a great job because they're short. They're like each about 15 minutes and he went through, he's got about 40 of them out now. So it's what about insomnia and what about, you know, why is REM important and what happens if I have a glass of wine before bedtime? So each one is about 15 minutes, but he does his first 10 or 15 really talk about important foundations of sleep, why they're significant and what disrupts them. So this is just a little background on him and why he's considered one of the foremost experts on sleep. He's written a book. He's written more than 100 scientific studies and had them published on it. Um, founder and director of the Center for Human Sleep Science. So he's looked at this a lot. Um, and one of the things, one of the big quotes from him is that in all this research, they found that all tissues and physi physiological systems in the body, most all operations of the mind are powerfully enhanced when we get sufficient sleep and demonstrably impaired, we don't get enough sleep. So I think that sums it up really well. Um, you're better when you sleep. Your body's better. Your brain's better. Your outlook on life is better when you get sleep. And, you know, we've talked about this before too, but I feel like it's so interesting and important is just when you think about the, the body and how we are all about survival of the species and anything that did not promote survival was basically phased out. So if it wasn't something that we needed to specifically stay alive, we don't do it anymore. And we still sleep and we have evolved to sleep, even though when you are sleeping, you are at your most vulnerable to something killing you. <laughs> Basically, like you don't, you're in a whole other world. You don't know what's, you're not on the alert outlook for danger and anything could attack you, but your body still chooses to do that, even though it could be dangerous at the time. And it also takes time away from looking for food taking care of your young, procreating, all the things we need to do to stay alive, we're not doing when we're sleeping. We're doing nothing. <laughs> so obviously it's And more... we do it one third of our life, right? One third of our life yeah. is basically spent sleeping. Significant portion is spent sleeping, even though it seems like what, what are we doing during then? Um, so if we kind of look at like, you know, what did our ancestors do? So their bedtime was about an hour or so after the sun went down. So it, in their terms, midnight literally is the middle of the night. Now, if you talk to people now, most people go to bed maybe 10, 30, 11. So midnight is, they've been asleep an hour. But our ancestors, that was the middle of the night. They got up before sunrise when their body temperature started to rise. So that was their big indicator. It was time to get up. And then they would take a nap in the middle of the day consistently. So they would have biphasic sleep. But I think this has been a confusing term to where um, people have thought biphasic sleep means that you sleep for a few hours and then you get up and you check email and you do stuff and then you go back to sleep. And that's okay because that's what our ancestors did, but that's not what they did. They slept in through the night. They may have gotten up a lot earlier and then they took a nap. So that was their biphasic sleep. And I, there's a lot of, you know, controversy about whether a nap is restorative. And I think it can be if you are able to do it consistently, but that is not the American lifestyle. Like it's not. Well, and I think the key live. is, I think the key is too, is that if you use your brain, the same part of your brain over and over again for a chunk of time, like in the morning, then what's going to happen is that piece of brain is going to wear out and you're going to have to drain some of the garbage out of it. The key is, is that when you nap, you don't want to go into REM sleep because then if you wake up and you've been in REM sleep, you're, you break your REM and therefore your body doesn't function as well. So depending upon your lifestyle, sleeping for 20 minutes or 25 minutes in the afternoon, set your alarm, you know, get your brain away from focusing on anything else. You, you have to let the garbage be cleaned up. And, and eight hours in front of the computer or working or this, your, your body will feel it. So I would not feel bad about whatever your job is, putting your head down on a desk or 
home or wherever you are for 15, 20 minutes and setting your alarm and letting your body and your brain reset itself, especially the parts that have been overworked. But I will say that if you struggle with falling asleep or you have insomnia, naps are probably not a good solution for you because you need to build up sleepiness during the day to be able to fall asleep at night. So like with me, if I try to take naps, I, and I actually did sleep, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night, which would make me absolutely miserable. So I do think that some of that is going to depend on your sleep personality. Like well, and a- when your nap is, because oh, I agree with that a lot later. In other words, it may be that if you're an up earlier person and you're sleeping from 12 to 1230, it's different than laying down at three o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. But so, yeah, your particular sleep style may be that you can't nap, but if you feel good with it, a lot of the issue is just don't sleep too long. Right. Yeah. So that's going to be an individual thing as far as naps go. But, you know, if you are in a society where that's written in, then that's easy. But we just don't generally have that. Um, So how much do you need? So basically, on average, seven to nine hours. And that means you need to be sleeping for seven to nine hours. So a lot of people, you know, it may take them an hour to fall asleep, or they may make up in the middle of the night. So you may need to be in bed longer to accumulate that. So one thing to think about is that if you didn't have to have an alarm to wake you up, would you just keep sleeping? Because if so, then you're probably sleep deprived. Your lifestyle is not working for you in regards to that. And that's really hard because a lot of it, you know, talking about sleep styles, like for teenagers, for example, the chronological style of a sleep of a teenager is to stay up later at night, just as they develop and they tend to sleep in. But school here, at least where I live, starts at seven o'clock in the morning, which is ridiculous. And you have to, they're forcing these teenagers to become an early bird when that's just not really what's in their natural, you know, kind of sleep style right now. And so they've shown in different states when they change the time of school starting, there's less accidents, there's better grades. So some people are unfortunately not fitting into the mold of their job or their school schedule you know, they may be a night owl, but still on average, everybody needs seven to nine hours. Some people talk about this DEC2 gene where people don't need as much sleep, but that's really, really, really rare. (laughs) Yeah, Matthew Walker says that. He said, there are people that need six hours of sleep and you're probably not one of them. Right, like 0.1% of the population, um, that's them. So most people are gonna fall into this, depending on your age, you know, of course, kids need more sleep than that, you know, that kind of thing. And then as you get older, a lot of times you will become where you go to sleep earlier and you wake up earlier, you know, all of that kind of depends on some things, but we're going to talk about what does it take to really good, good quality sleep. So I'm going to go into that on the next slide. But um, one of the other things that he talks about a lot is that when you take things like Ambien or alcohol to sleep, you're not really sleeping. You are sedated. (laughs) you giving the impression because you're away from your thoughts, which is helpful. I think to take a break from yourself, but you're not going through the re- restoration of sleep. You're not going through REM where things are repairing. Um, and so when they actually look at studies of people that are on ambient sleep, they have an increased mortality risk, which shows that like the purpose of sleep is to help restore. And that doesn't seem to be happening when it's induced by a pharmaceutical, unfortunately, or at least the pharmaceuticals we have now. It doesn't seem they've come out with a drug that helps this. It just keeps you sedated. Just, and alcohol is kind of the same. Which is why when we look at menopause, one of the issues is, is that estrogen, progesterone, all that are significant in healthy sleep. When we lose that, that's sometimes where sleep problems come in. And oral progesterone getting into your system can help bring that good sleep back. But Sleep trackers can always let you know where you are. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So here's some things you can help, how you can improve your sleep. So number one, people say this over and over again, have a regular schedule. So really work on going to bed at the same time during the weekday and on the weekends and getting up at the same time as much as you can. Your brain is a creature of habit and association. And so you really want to get into the habit to where you start to get sleepy at the same time and then you naturally wake up at the same time as much as possible. I mean, this is not, you know, if you're a new parent or something, I mean, that's not going to fit you at the time, but that's the goal that we're going for as much as possible. So, I mean, there's of course caveats and sometimes just where you are in life isn't going to fit this, but 
when you're in the perimenopause and menopausal state, a lot of people struggle with sleep and just saying, I'm going to go to bed at this time every night, regardless, is a good kind of habit to get into. But you also want to have good sleep hygiene where you make your room the right temperature. So your body temperature has to drop about two and two, two and a half degrees to sleep. So that's significant, really. 67 is optimal for most. That's pretty cold. <laughs> so you want to have a cool environment um, and you want it to be dark. Like it, any part of light that hits any part of your body, your body will think it's daytime. And so you have to be really careful about that. And even what your habits are before you go to bed. So if you're the study that he talked about when people looked at an iPad, that would be the same as your phone. An hour before you go to bed, your melatonin production went down by 50%. Melatonin is absolutely crucial to be able to sleep. And they compared that to people just reading a book in a really dim light. It was significant difference. Then also the peak melatonin in the middle of the night to keep you asleep, you didn't have that as much when you exposed yourself to light so much before you went to bed. So that's something I think a lot of people have gotten into a bad habit. A lot of patients I know tell me they scroll on their phone in their bed to try to fall asleep. And I think that's a significantly negative habit when it comes to- And it's really about your own melatonin. Taking five or 10 milligrams of melatonin is not gonna hurt you. It's an antioxidant and helps your mitochondria, but it's not gonna do anything for your sleep. Go outside for 10 minutes in the dark. That's really the big key. And then stay away from the phone. Yeah. And, and besides the fact that you, a lot of times what you're reading on your phone is jacking you up. You know, you're reading stressful news or you see something on Facebook or Instagram that upsets you, or you're watching crazy TikTok videos. <laughs> Those are not conducive. Yeah, to not helpful to go to bed. So anyway, start to dim your lights an hour before you go to bed. Then another thing habit wise is that if you're not sleeping and you're in your bed, you should get out of your bed. Because your brain, again, associates certain things with certain places. So some people will say, well, I fall asleep on the couch and then I go and get in my bed and I'm instantly awake. Well, now your body has associated the couch with sleep and your bed with wake time. So you need to reverse those habits to where your bed is to either for doing fun things with your spouse or sleeping <laughs> other things. So you want to have that association in your brain. And then limiting ca caffeine and alcohol. So we talked about the alcohol. It's a sedative. It's not really sleeping. So you're falling. You feel like you're falling asleep. But when they look at people that have had alcohol-induced sleep, they're, again, not getting that REM sleep. It's fragmented. A lot of times you'll wake up a lot from it. And women, a lot of times, will admit this. So like, okay, I'll fall asleep, but then it's tossing and turning all night. Like, you're never really getting that deep sleep. You're just kind of vegged out, but you're not, you know, your brain's not in that deep state. And then caffeine, it has a half-life of six hours and a quarter life of 12 hours. So Thinking about people, I'm super sensitive to caffeine. If I had it, you know, even at 12 o'clock, I would still feel it at night, depending on the type of caffeine that I had because I'm a very slow metabolizer of caffeine. So you need to think about that in regards to if you're not sleeping well, it could be your coffee or even your tea if you're super sensitive that's keeping you awake, even if you feel like you're having it early enough. Do a trial of not having any caffeine and see what you notice in regards to that. Anything you want to add? Nope, I think you're good. I think that okay. that you develop sleep pressure through the day and it will take your body down at night. So just kind of respect that ability of what your body needs to do and then kind of follow it through. And I think Matthew Walker says 30 minutes or 20 minutes in bed before you go to sleep to calm the yeah. system. Give yourself some time. Yeah. So, so, so I hope you guys have enjoyed this series. Um, I have the picture here that I sent out in a newsletter after Andy's party because <laughs> it's one of my favorites. A picture of Dr. Ginsburg at her medical school graduation. <laughs> Hard to believe. Hard to believe. Yep, yep. A long guy. Who who would have thought back then? But uh, but yeah, nice memory. Nice memory. Yeah. So all right. So I hope you guys have enjoyed our little series on easy things you can do to get and stay healthy. I mean, we wanted to focus on things you can do as opposed to what you shouldn't be doing, what we want to take away. These are all positive things. And, and so if you haven't seen the videos, go back and check those out. 
and good time again with holiday because this will give yeah. you easy things to say, okay, coming out of holiday, a little bit of New Year's resolutions. I'm going to be careful as I go into holiday, but then coming around the corner, these are things like, that are really doable to make me healthy for the new year. Yes. All right. Thanks, everybody.